So welcome everyone. Welcome to the uh, March 2021 monthly meeting. Uh, we are virtual again and I think we'll be virtual for a while. Um, welcome everyone. Um, it was uh, early this afternoon when I got notified that uh, our featured speaker tonight. Um, oh, what happened here? How come, how come I can't do this? There we go. Dr. Timothy Ferris, our featured speaker tonight, was uh, asking if he could join early and uh, get his talk out of the way. And I said, absolutely. If he's, if he's the featured speaker, we certainly want him. So to introduce him, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, an author. He's the author of Seeing in the Dark, which is a book I'm holding right here in my hand. And I took a glance at the, at the, at the preface before uh, uh, the meeting tonight. And uh, he is noted as a lifelong um, stargazer, and that's that's enough to get me excited and say welcome, Dr. Ferris, to uh, the Minnesota Astronomical Society virtual meeting. And I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. And uh, the floor is yours for as long as you want to occupy it tonight. Well, thank you all. I uh, uh, appreciate you uh, all turning out, and, I, and thanks for adjusting your schedule to accommodate me. I have to drive north this evening, and um, now, if I, is everything? Do I look all right? Are these settings okay? No, you look okay. fantastic. All right, so everything's good, and I can see those of you who wish to be seen. Um, and it's, it brings to mind all sorts of Zoom stories, doesn't it? Um, anyhow, yes, I thought I would uh, talk a bit about um, my own involvement in um, amateur astronomy and um, then see what uh, you all might like to talk about. Uh, now, some of the things I'm going to mention are in the book Seeing in the Dark, so I don't want to, uh, those who've read the book, I don't want to go over too much, but I did uh, long have an ambition to write a book about the experience of doing what you all do. And I'm uh, glad that I got the opportunity to do so. My own involvement dates back to 1956 um, when there was an opposition of Mars. And uh, my parents gave me as a Christmas present a 1.6 inch refracting telescope which is an objective lens slightly smaller than one of the lenses of the glasses I'm wearing. Uh, so it wasn't a lot of, eye, of uh, light gathering power. But I was able to see that opposition of Mars and um, down in South Florida where I was as a boy, uh, the skies were uh, remarkably good in those days. They're still remarkably good as, uh, uh, as we see examples of all the time in terms of uh, the steadiness of the air. The uh, darkness of the sky has deteriorated, of course. Uh, and the, there's some more thermal stacking in the, the seeing around the city and all, but uh, uh, still, uh, still an amazing place. And there wasn't a great deal else to do where we started out in rural Florida. Uh, so I, I, I got a book from the Branch Library and started learning the constellations and I still remember the remarkable day when the librarian at the branch library, I'd been going back and forth checking out a book at a time, informed me that I could check out more than one book at a time. And I said, well, how many? And she said, well, there really isn't any limit. <laughs> so, so I started going home every week with armloads of, uh, of books, many of them on science. and. I, I remember at age 12 or 13 being very impressed by the authors of these books that here were grown-ups who could do other things, you know, some of them were astronomers, some of them were amateur astronomers, or, but who took the time and effort to explain complicated scientific matters in a way that even someone like myself uh, was in a poor family, uh, going to a bad school in, a, in the middle of nowhere, could, um, 
could understand that I could that I could educate myself in this this fashion. Um, and I that that may be why I ended up doing the same sort of thing myself. It, I know it did make a, a strong moral impression on me. So I got odd jobs and was able to step up to a 2.4 inch refractor. And by then we'd moved to Kibis Kane, which was not quite so rural and uh, and, not, and had, had a better school. Uh, I always went to public schools uh, through uh, kindergarten through uh, high school. And uh, fortunately the schools there were um, good and, and I was able to learn a lot of stuff. Uh, we had, there were, I was able to take Latin, for instance, in a public school, a class which you had to speak Latin to if nothing else. It was quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, so I went off to university and studied uh, humanities, not science so much, but my, I did have to take a, a science course. So of course I chose astronomy and it was taught by a guy named Carl Hennies. Did any of you ever meet Carl Hennies? No, he was, um, he had a beard. He was, it must have been just in his 30s when he was our professor, but was in this big lecture hall at Northwestern. And I think that many of us, I guess we were freshmen, um, regarded him as an ancient figure. Uh, you know, an, an ancient professor must have been the beard. And he, he once said in class, startled everybody that uh, people were going to be flying in space soon and that it was possible that even someone in that classroom that uh, maybe his generation the rest of people were too old but someone in that classroom might fly in space one day and the odd thing is that so far as I know the only person in that classroom who did that was Carl Hennies himself who went on to join the astronaut program and had a had a shuttle flight uh, I saw Carl at a meeting of the uh, of an astronomical association out here in on the West Coast, and we went for a fast drive out in the country in a eight-cylinder Porsche. And I remember him saying, "We well, this is the sort of car we astronauts are supposed to drive." <laughs> He's quite a guy. Carl died uh, trying to climb Everest in his sixties. Uh, took a medical risk and lost it. So. So the space age is very much upon us. Um, and the, in the, um, the workshop for that class out under the stars, um, I had a fraternity thing I had to go to and I was trying to leave the, the, the laboratory early, but I didn't want to offend the graduate student who was teaching it. He was lecturing away. And then behind him, uh, as, as it happened, appeared the Echo 1 satellite. So after a few moments, I interrupted him, said, I was sorry to interrupt, but if, if the students wanted to look at the ECHO satellite, I calculated that it was going to pass into the Earth's shadow within the next half minute. So we wanted to get a look while we can. We all took a look and it disappeared into the shadow and I got an A in the class. And so that was uh, <laughs> the observing side of it came in, came in pretty handy. Um, when... Um, when it came time to write a book about this stargazing experience and, you know, I'd, I'd spent so many hours, as you have, uh, at dark sky sites, um, hour upon hour, staying up all night. When I was in high school, we used to put the telescope up on the roof of the house to, to get better horizons. And we could see rocket launches from the Cape there too, which was terrific. Um, and I, I I wondered whether it might be possible to write um, a book about that experience and um, why it means so much to uh, folks like us. And uh, at the time I was, I was living in Florence at the time and making a film called Life Beyond Earth. So I was happy to see a critic the other day say that that film is now, I don't know, 13 years or old or 17 years or something. And he said, still the best treatment of that subject, which I appreciated. Um, and, uh, and my crew appreciated being able to come over to Florence to shoot some scenes that were, where the, the place I'd rented was across the street from where Galileo lived when he was in Florence. 
And I think I figured out where he did his observations because if you, if you just went up this rather steep street, uh, at the top, there was a kind of park, a little public park where it used to be a fortification. And these wide uh, stone walls that you could uh, be easy to set a small refractor like his up on. So, so I was very much imbued, you know, with the history of astronomy in that location. And it's, it's in that, it's outside that house or in that house rather, that we shot the, uh, what they, what some call the now famous lobster scene from, uh, from that film, um, Life Beyond Earth. Uh, so if you, if you're interested, uh, Google it. And um, that's on that ancient street where that uh, where Galileo lived for about two years. And I, so I was thinking a lot about the next project being amateur astronomy and, um, uh, and to see if it might work, I wrote a piece for the New Yorker about stargazing. And that seemed to go pretty well. So I contracted to, to write the book and some of you may have encountered me as I was going around interviewing folks for that. And because uh, uh, these portraits of amateur astronomers figure in the book. Uh, and I, I, it was all about trying to get this sense of a connection to the, to the sky. Uh, about 25 years ago, I moved down here to California and uh, my wife's family had a place that her grandfather bought uh, back in the 60s up in Sonoma County on Sonoma Mountain. And so I, I used to observe up there and I, I got one of those um, NGT-18s and would roll it around and found a good site to build an observatory. Um, and that was puzzling over, you know, how if, if you've done it, you know, it's a long process to figure out how what your observatory is going to be like. I wanted to roll off roof because um, I like being out under the sky. And I've been in professional observatories a lot in these domes. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's great if you're not in them a lot. But if you're in there really and you want to have the experience, you're better off, I think, out, with, out under the sky. And I kept the, the walls low too, so that you would also be aware of the surrounding land. And, you know, it's, it's quite a lovely experience, as it always is, of course. But the price for that is, and of course, when it's closed up and raining, anytime you want to do anything to the telescope, you're in there on your hands and knees, and it's not, the, not an ideal situation. In any event, I was, as I was working on the plans for this, I, I had a call from an architect who lived in our area. He was president at the time of the American Association of Architects, and he asked if I would give a keynote speech at their annual convention. And I said, well, I don't know, you know, it, it, to, to work up a speech for an architecture group is a lot of work. And you, you say you're not, you know, you know, you're, you're not, not going to pay an honorarium. And it just doesn't make sense for me to burn that much time on it. He said, well, how about if I trade you a consultancy? So I said, okay, and he came out and um, consulted on the observatory. And I picked this spot where the seeing, I tested the seeing and it was good. It had a lot of uh, oak trees to one side that was obscuring too much of the sky. And um, he came and said, do you have a ladder? And I said, yeah, and we got an orchard ladder. And we set it up down the hillside a bit and climbed up to a point level with the, where the land is. Now we're up in the air and it was a beautiful, it was exactly the right place to put the telescope. And I said, well, yeah, this is great, but you're now you're talking about a three story structure. Whereas I had this little, you know, shack on the ground. And he said, uh, well, what do you think architects are for? We, we show up, we give you a vision and we spend much more of your money. So we did build that. Uh, the guys who built it never built a structure before, but they were really dedicated. And, um, and it was two guys and they used to sleep there four nights a week and work on it. It was really, really a lovely job. And um, I, it was too big a thing for me to build alone. This 45% of the, of the uh, project is in the foundations and the separate foundations. The telescope sits atop a 42 foot pier at that point. 
But amazingly, it has all worked. The mirror is still the same one from the uh, Jim Burr's uh, NGT-18. Everything else has been swapped out over the years as, as those things do. So it's an 18-inch F5 reflector. Um, and um, an engine of happiness, although it's, uh, it's hard to say why. So even after writing the book, I've never quite figured out to make sure this isn't an emergency of some sort. No, it's not. I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyhow, I'm going to um, open this up for questions in a moment. I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, I've been using the observatory lately to record YouTube videos, which none of which have been released yet. I think we've done five of them so far. These are going to be a series of short. Uh, the, the target's nine minutes. Some of them get up to as long as 12 on a wide variety of, uh, of subjects, everything from quantum field theory to love. The next one we record is about love, called Who Wrote the Book of Love? And um, once we have enough of them to be, to, to be a, a, an interesting enough body of work so that if you liked one, there, you know, there would be more than two or three others to look at, uh, we'll, um, we'll release those. Um, and I suppose that came out of the pandemic experience. Anyhow, um, you know, one of the subjects I've been involved in uh, over the years is um, the question of intelligent life in the universe. The title of the book that Sklovsky wrote in Russia and that Carl Sagan annotated and published with his annotations under the same title. Here in the late 60s, maybe as late as 1970, um, and it was because I read that book that I went up and interviewed Carl for Rolling Stone magazine and we became friends and led to the Voyager record and all that. So it, the question of extraterrestrial life, which I assume is widespread and of intelligence about which no one really is in a position to make any judgment. Uh, I have been, I've been thinking about this lately and I think, Part of the problem is that in contemplating intelligence is that we, um, th there are a couple of things. One is we come from a tradition that insisted that humans were different from every other species on the planet. Um, and of course, that's just not the case. We are animals and we're, we are related to every other form of life on the planet. Secondly, because we have language and other animals don't, and that's an absolute, by the way, that there's a lot of loose talk about animal languages, but believe me, if any animals had a language in the terms of an abstract symbolic language, the way I can speak to you and you can understand me, they would have very different careers than they do. Uh, but one of the things that really impressed me about our, our period of, of time in the world is that um, is our, our incredible ignorance of, uh, of the other animals. I think that's one of the things that's really going to be held against us in the future. Uh, not out of a warm-hearted sympathy for animals, although Lord knows I've got that, but uh, because we just, we, we don't, I, I, I don't see any possible way in which human intelligence would be unique. I assume that it's like computer processing power. And I said, I see nothing wrong with that metaphor, even though many people are offended by it for some reason. Uh, and this simply because we have significantly more process processing power per cubic centimeter in the brain than any other animals, we're able to do these things like write books that the other animals can't. But that distinction um, covers up as much as it reveals. And so if you, think, if you think of intelligence as processing power, then you pretty soon come around to a view in which uh, there has to be some level of intelligence in anything uh, for it to sustain a stable configuration of its own uh, quantum fields. It's a big subject. I won't go further down that path. But that prejudice plus the, the religious prejudice of having been taught that we're entirely different than 
everything else in the world that we were sort of set down here like the guests at a hotel uh, has made it difficult to understand, to think properly about the question of extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, I don't know how widespread intelligence is or how long it lasts or any of those, neither does anybody else. But the, the fact is that and human intelligence does not exist in the universe. It is part of the universe. So is the intelligence of every other creature on Earth. So is the intelligence of plants and the low-level intelligence of stone. So that the, this is not some miracle, so far as I can tell, that we're here, because we came here through straight evolution, nothing else. There wasn't some bolt of lightning or some weird uh, event that you wouldn't expect to happen on an ordinary planet. Um, I, I, don't, I don't say that I know why our level of intelligence arose. And we, uh, we can only speculate about that. But I've come to the view that since we're sitting here having evolved in this way and, and we're, we're very much aware of intelligence, we're able to create now lots of artificial intelligence, all of which, by the way, is also driven by processing power. There's a, the, the algorithms are great and everything, but um, it's really just these, uh, these blind evolutionary processes going on that can create these, uh, these incredible innovations. So um, I think that the, the future discussions of these issues will be more about a, um, a universe as it is, which is to say, which all these systems are integrated. Um, and none of it's erased, by the way. Every, every moment of your life and my life is permanent, thanks to the way the quantum fields operate. Uh, and I, I find that view um, to be quite uh, encouraging for doing what we all need to do, which is to keep on learning. So I'm going to stop talking now and see what if you all have questions. So I invite everybody uh, to uh, open up their mic and uh, ask Dr. Ferris a question, uh, a question about yeah, I guess I can start. Hi, this is Suresh. No. Uh, I remember one of my very first astronomy books that I ever read was a Timothy Ferris book called Galaxy. Oh, yes. Which is right here. <laughs> yeah. You get it on Amazon. Um, <laughs> so what I was thinking is, um, I love deep sky objects. And from the time you wrote that book in the early 80s, to, you know, now we're in the, the Hubble, the Chandra, the Spitzer, all uh, the, the, um, the bigger observatories you've had since then. Our understanding of galaxies has changed quite a bit. How would you, where would you start describing the changes after you wrote the book to where we are now on, on understanding galaxies? Well, dynamics is a big, big one. Uh, back then, there wasn't enough computer power to do meaningful simulations of uh, galactic dynamics, and not enough was known about uh, dark matter and so forth, how galaxies actually rotate. If you look at these simulations now online of uh, colliding galaxies, really it's hard to escape the impression that what you're seeing is the interaction of a pair of black holes and that everything else is just filigree. You know, the, the black holes are really the anchors and um, that's, it would have been nice to, you know, to talk about, about that. There's so many other things that have come to be known. Um, and of course, visually, we were, when Galaxies was published, we were just about at the end of the time when you, it was still possible to produce a print book at that level of quality and sell it for a price that was anywhere within reach of a general audience. And it was also just when there were enough astronomical photos of sufficient quality to put in such a book, and only just enough, we were just really pushing it. Now, there, the photos are in abundance, but if you were to make a galaxies book that was that used every meaningful photo, or you know, you would be doing a selection, of course. But I should think, um, you know, you ended up end up with something that was hundreds of pages. You know, it was just inches thick, and would cost a thousand dollars or something like that. So it was an odd. It was crossing of curves. You know, it's uh, it's something you see in a lot of fields like global warming. Um, the the uh, glo as global warming increases, the cost of mitigating increases, but the dollars you're using to spend 
uh, become less valuable because the world gets richer every day. Uh, the liquidity of the world today is kind of an amazing fact. Uh, literally, there was never an optimist with enough imagination to come, come close to imagining the uh, levels of wealth we have in the world today. And I'm not talking about a few trillionaires. I'm talking about median incomes around the world. We don't live in any longer in a world in which, you know, most people are poor, or half of it's poor or anything. It's a, it's a bell curve world of abundance. So uh, the doing anything gets cheaper. You know, NASA couldn't go to Mars 10, 20 years ago because no one would put up the money. Now it's going to be possible to do it probably without even using public money if, if necessary. Uh, so those were the crossing curves we had there. The photos were just getting good enough to be amazing. But the, but the uh, ability to actually print and sell a book of that sort was, uh, was going away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Timothy, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, my question is, and, and thanks for speaking to our club tonight. I wanted to ask you, so your, your book, um, Seen in the Dark, is my favorite all-time astronomy book. In, in fact, I actually really like the audio book because you have – um, you actually narrate the audio, which is, which is often not the case with a lot of these audio books. My, my, my question to you is, is the video of Seeing the Dark is very different, though, than the book. And how did you choose which stories you were going to include that were in the book compared to those that are only in the film, vice versa? Well, the, the, the fi film is such a different medium. We could still call it film, but uh, let's see. Seeing in the Dark was shot on... Uh, digital chips. It was one of the first um, true HD 1080p films to be made. Um, that was a big technical issue for us that uh, I, I selected my director of photography because he knew more about 1080 than anybody in Hollywood, anyone else in Hollywood. And um, it, it, a lot of that book was concerned with trying to, a lot of that film was concerned with trying to recreate the experience, you know, of being out there. And uh, it, it, it there are incredible problems in making something look natural. Just the uh, a twinkling of stars, for instance, took we uh, two studios in two different cities working on that for weeks and weeks. And uh, it's, I finally had to just shoot some twinkling stars and get telecomputer, do it like this, and <laughs> take it back from, uh, from the analog nature source. Um, uh, one of the reasons I've, I've made a few films is they are so different from books. You know, people talk about the other side of the brain. Uh, that's obviously a bit of oversimplification, but it, it, it really is quite different. And as with any project, the thing you have to do with a film is to not over-determine it. it, it it's... Um, a lot of big expensive documentaries got ruined because people made decisions way too early on without, rather than letting the content dictate. So you'd get people who say, we're gonna spend $20 million on a 10 part series before they ever did any research on whether it should be a 10 part series. Um, so I've, I don't even like to know how long they're gonna be when I start them and just let the, <coughs> excuse me, let the, uh, the material itself dictate the outcome. It's a similar thing with planetarium shows. You, you, you don't want to restrict yourself unnecessarily at the, um, at the, at the outset, um, but to let the organic process of creation uh, build up the film. I've just been reading a biography of um, Whose biography am I just reading? Let's see. Um, Mike Nichols. And, uh, you know, Mike Nichols was the comedian in Nichols and May and then uh, went on to be very successful in um, Broadway and then made a series of films, including The Graduate and uh, some things that um, were very influential at the time. And it was just, it's just real interesting, particularly like, like legitimate theater the amount of work you have to do, and you're starting there with a script, you know every word that's going to be in it, but just the amount of work it takes to, to go from there to a, uh, to a finished product. So with the film, um, you pretty much start over um, and just build everything um, afresh. Um, 
And I, I hope I got across some of that, that sense of it in the, in the film. It's, uh, but the fact is that although cameras on telescopes are great, no camera to this day, still or a motion picture camera can capture what your eye captures when you're just standing out in the backyard looking at the sky. The brain constructs a unified world in which you can see the dark landscapes and the sky and the color of the stars and everything all, all integrated. Cam cameras can't do that. They, they're, they're trying. There are all sorts of efforts to make them work that way. But so far, they haven't worked very well at all. So, because really what you're saying is you want a piece of, of kit that would do the job of the human brain. And that's, uh, we're not there yet. Um, Dr. Ferris? Yes. Um, so I'm a visual observer. I have a 32 inch reflector. So I like to look at things that are quite faint. Yes. And um, I want, I guess I, my question to you is if you can somehow compare or quantify the value of visual observing as opposed to the course, the recent trend in imaging among amateur astronomers, uh, just from your perspective, what you've done and what you've seen. Yeah, it's, um... It's such a complicated subject. The, I do like visual observing, um, and I spent decades looking primarily at galaxies, um, just by the hundreds and hundreds. Um, I, I would pretend I was looking for supernovae, but that I wasn't particularly interested whether I was going to find anything. I just wanted to look at these galaxies. At my site is not particularly high altitude, and it's not... Uh, and the sky is not terribly dark. It's only 60 miles out of San Francisco. So the, there's a limit to the visual stuff that you wouldn't have at a better, better site. But I, um, I still do look at stuff with the 18 inch. And also there's a Teleview 127 uh, mounted on that uh, system as well. And I've been using it with um, DSLRs for color stuff because I've, I've always been a photographer and I still still like to kind of shoot with regular cameras. Um, but when uh, when I called Al Nagler to congratulate him on that design when it was a new instrument, and first thing he said was, "Well, you, you're you are looking through it too, though, right?" <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> not just taking pictures. I guess everybody's <coughs> was always taking you know, taking photos rather than looking. So I, I still look and, and, you know, having guests up is a big help too, because they always, they want to look. And uh, you can show them an image of a galaxy building on a monitor and then that does help them, I think, you know, to, to, to be patient, sit and look. There's so many people, they're accustomed to 60 frames a second and, you know, they're looking at an eyepiece for, for two seconds and they think that's it. And you, know, you have to, you know, encourage them to, to take a longer look. And it's, it still does, um, it still does amazing, amazing things. Um, one of the things I like about um, the quantum field theory view is that it, it, it's, it, it, it's much more revelatory or explanatory when it comes to things like using a telescope. Because we, you know, science writers write casually about, oh, the photon striking my eye traveling for two million years from the Andromeda galaxy. But that's not actually the right choice of words. There wasn't any photon between the Andromeda galaxy and your eye. The, the quantum field created the photon when it encountered your eye because you asked it a question. And the question your eye asked it is, where are you? And the answer it gave is a position answer. And that, that position answer will always look like a particle. So you can count the, pho the, the photons you know, stacking up in your CCD. But they weren't photons until the moment they got to your chip. Before that, they were excitations in, uh, in a quantum field. And that picture, although it's more subtle, uh, is a lot closer to the facts than imagining that space is full of BBs flying around from, from all these stars. So congratulations on your visual work. And I'm glad we still got these great visual observers, and people drawing stuff and everything. That's, it's all part of the same interaction between the mind and the rest of the universe. Uh, which did create uh, the mind. I wonder why. Dr. Ferris, there's a question off the uh, off the chat that says, 
if version 2.0 of the Voyager golden record were to be made today, how or should, uh, would it be different from the original version? Maybe you can talk about that. Well, I, I would have made the same record. Um, the, technologically, I mean, obviously in terms of content, I would say that you could make a Voyager record every year and forever and they'd all be good records. It's, it's not difficult to make a terrific record if you've got all the music on earth to choose from. Uh, but I, I, there is no better technology now. I, I, would, I would use the same technology because I can warranty that technology for at least a billion years. And there is none other that, I, that I'd be able to warranty. So I, I would still make a metal record on it. That's a copy of it back there on the wall, if you can see it hanging up. It was, uh, that's uh, not the real record. No one has, no civilian has a copy of the record. We never did that. But... Uh, that's from the excellent um, Oz Re Ozma Records release a couple of years ago. They did a, a beautiful representation of you know, the uh, metal jacket. So that, that's what I have left from that, <laughs> that experience. Uh, I, I noticed that there, uh, the, every so often there are efforts to do something like the Voyager record and I, I don't know them in any detail, um, but I, I would recommend um, uh, that I, I would, I would, we, we were interested in trying to put our best foot forward. What's the best sort of music that we, we think we've been able to make? Um, approaches that simply involve everyone that wants to be involved, every sound, every picture someone wants to send, or I can understand the why you might want to take an inclusive approach like that, but as a production, um, to my mind, I always wanted to make a record you could sit down and listen to, and you'd say, oh, that's a good experience listening to it. Rather than if you just send volumes of information, then that's, that's a different approach. From a creative standpoint, I wouldn't find that as interesting. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you, you're obviously quite the philosopher here, and I, I guess one of the things I was thinking of more philosophically is part of our mission in this club is to have outreach to the community, you know, related to astronomy and all that. And I'm, I'm actually interested in your uh, opinion of what are the, what would be a, a valuable kind of a outreach uh, that we can do that goes beyond just showing people stuff in the skies? Well, I don't know. Um, I think, I know, I, I know what you guys are doing and it's very impressive. You have the dark sky site and the more accessible sites and the public stuff and, um, I'm, I'm not sure how much more you can do. The, uh, uh, the people either get this stuff or they don't, and we're not reaching everyone who might get it. That's true. Um, and it's um, there. there you know, I'm sure you've had the experience that you'll get people who really, if it weren't for that moment of seeing Saturn, really might have never caught on to this this stuff at all. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I've been involved in these um, educational outreach projects funded by the National Science Foundation, where you look at the nation's hundred some odd thousand science classrooms. And um, I know that with the internet, it's, it's improved the ability to get materials into the hands of teachers. Um, and they can sensitize students. But in the end, you know, although I've, I've been a teacher four different colleges and everything, I, I don't hold much with teaching. I, I, in the end, it's really learning. How do you facilitate learning? And um, as far as I can tell, well, the way you're approaching it is, is, is the, the best, best possible way to make it, make it an experience that people will remember. When I, when I was a little kid, I was in Miami Beach, Florida with, one night with my dad and here parked at the curb was a uh, an enormous telescope on a trailer. It was just an exposed, huge instrument. I don't, don't recall the size of it, and I was little, but easily 20 inches, probably more closer to 30 inch, on a big heavy mountain, motorized mountain, everything was, there were no Dobsonians in those days. But he was doing what John Dobson did. He was showing people views through this telescope, and I looked through it from, and, and you know, it's the same thing we depicted in the film and that you, you guys have all done to, you can be in the middle of these bright lights and yet you can still see these things that are so far away. So that was great 
outreach, and it was completely by chance that I even happened to uh, to see it. So um, I, I I appreciate the spirit of the question. I know what you, that you're you're uh, you're trying to do all you can, um, but I I don't I don't have. I wish I had a a great single idea, but I don't. Thank you. Thank you. So l let me ask. Um, uh, this is this is Thor. I'm, I I want to recognize that Dave Tosteson, our our wonderful uh, observer, is also a very talented writer, and um, and I know that one of the most influential books in my coming into this uh, hobby was was yours, Coming of Age in the Milky Way, and I'd like to know a little bit more about how you how you organize the stories that go into these very compelling narratives that, that manage to capture and keep our attention throughout the, the, the whole volume? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And the, the answer really is just brutally hard work. Um, my first book was so difficult that I, I'm not a religious person, but I found myself vowing, you know, if you're up there, if you'll let me finish this, I promise I'll never try to write another book. <laughs> it's, just, it's so pathetically difficult to uh, to write anything that, that's worth reading, much less 60,000 words of it. Um, the Coming of Age in the Milky Way was one of those brash projects that you conceive of when you're young. You say, well, no one has done this. Um, and it's a great story. And so, and then you go to work on it. And after a few years, you figure out why no one's done it uh, because it's just titanically difficult. And, you know, I had to ransack libraries in a half a dozen different cities over a period of, uh, I think that book took 12 years. We had support from um, a couple, there were a couple of grant supports for it. Um, it, um, it just, um, it, 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 just took forever. But the great thing is that you do learn all that stuff because you, you, you can't write a decent sentence unless you know what you're talking about. So you have to learn a lot. And uh, that was a, was a terrific kind of postgraduate education for me. And in terms of how you organize it and all, um, you know, there, it's just... Um, an awful lot of revising and changing things around and so forth. The, the, the work submitted to the publisher was probably about the 21st draft. Uh, it is, it's just a, just tons of paper that if you stack up the drafts, they're as, as, as high as you, as you are standing. Um, and how old were you when you did that project? Well, let's see. Um, I wrote, uh, I, I, I remember remember when I was working on The Red Limit, which was published in 1977. So at that point I was uh, 33 years old. Um, I was having trouble at tons of research in my place in Gramercy Park in New York. And I, I went up to see Sagan, um, I, think, I think I went up to watch the Super Bowl together. And then I was going home, he, he drove me out to the airport. My uh, flight was delayed a half hour or something. And um, Carl, on the drive out, Carl said, uh, how's it going with the book? And I said, I'm having organizational problems. Um, you know, this is the old problem in science writing is how do you say anything until you've explained what it means? And if, if, if you're explaining what it means, you're going to lose your readers and the thousands of words it takes to, so it, it, was, it was that kind of problem. And Carl said, well, if, you know, if, if um, you have anything you want to show me at any point, we used to edit each other's stuff. So I said, sure, you know, and that was it. That was the extent to which we talked about the book. And I said, you go on home, the flight will be here in a little while and I'll, I'll just get something to eat at the coffee shop. But I sat down in the coffee shop, ordered a cup, cup of coffee, slice of pie, turned the paper uh, placemat over, took out a pen and wrote the 12 chapters of that book down. There was something about that two minute conversation that I just suddenly thought, oh, wait a minute, I see how I can organize it. And I wrote that book from that placemat. So, I would work for months and months on a chapter when I finally had a decent draft. And that's another problem in books 
is you got to have a draft that's good enough that you can move on to the next thing, but but not so good that it's gonna you, you're being wasting time if it turns out that you have to throw most of it away as you usually do. Um, and I would get a chapter done. I was writing on an old regular typewriter. I'd set it aside, and then I'd get the placemat and see what the next chapter was. I only changed one chapter in that that outline. So it's different every time, and. Um, I think that the main trick is, and this I noticed this, I was reading the Mike Nichols book about plays, the same, he was saying the same thing, that you have to allow the project to come alive and then it'll help you finish it. At, uh, uh, there's a certain point with a book that the, you know, the book will start saying, well, no, you can't do that here. I'm not that kind of a book. And that's a great moment for a writer because then you know you're on the last lap. From there on, you know, you've, you've got something that started to stand up and walk and um, but when people say occasionally, I remember a Nobel laureate saying to me, uh, I'm considering taking my, the entire summer to write a popular book because he had been offered a big contract. And I said, that's great, but you're not going to be able to do it in the summer. You know, you're a smart guy. You can write a book in a summer, but it won't be a good book because you, you what you'll do is you'll overdetermine everything. You'll write it out of an outline. It'll just lie there and then you'll deliver it because you only you didn't give yourself enough time. So I think it's oh, creativity is a mysterious pro, pro, uh, aspect of any of these projects. So to some degree, you are, uh, you're just betting that you can, uh, you can make it work. And it won't always. You do have to abandon things. I abandoned a book just last year. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a bungee jump. Sometimes you have to kill your little darlings. Oh, every day. Um, you know, there's always, I used to tell my students, there's usually one thing, you know, in an article or a book, particularly books, because you, it goes on for years. And you tell yourself when you're feeling low, oh, well, this is awfully hard, but I've got the wonderful thing. You know, there's that wonderful thing in the book. And it's, if, 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 if something that wonderful can be in the book, then maybe the rest of it has some. And you know where this is leading. And in the end, you're going to throw that thing out because it, its job was just to get you across the river. And then you don't carry the boat with you after that. You leave the boat, you know, and, that, and that's the wonderful thing was just to keep you afloat for a while. And um, particularly fine writing is like that. You know, if you, you write a great passage and it might even be great, you know, and I once wrote a whole paragraph that actually was good in the first draft. It's the only time it ever happened to me. I remember exactly it was four something in the afternoon, sometime in the uh, mid eighties. And, um, uh, I just stared at it. I thought, that's amazing. There's only two words that are wrong in this whole thing. Never happened before. <laughs> uh, so you, you have to, the job of a writer, you have to get used to, and I think these other creative arts are like that too. You have to get used to uh, just um, sticking with it and dealing constantly with, with a bad material. Most of, most of the time, writers are working with bad drafts. And they're just trying to make them less bad. And filmmakers watch film all the time and think about it. It was uh, Francis Coppola built an observatory. I went over to have dinner with him, talk about it. And, and I gave him a DVD of seeing in the dark. And he said, oh, great. We'll sit down after dinner and watch it together. And I just really got cold feet. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to sit next to Francis Ford Coppola and watch seeing in the dark. It's an okay film, but. <laughs> I just don't think that I don't have that kind of confidence in the project. <laughs> so it's a, it's a messy business. And uh, the, the fact that, you know, a filmmaker at that stage of his career would want to look at something you just handed him is because that's what he does. You know, he's just fascinated by film. Uh, so all, all different, different world way writers are with books. We got about two minutes left, so let's, uh, I'm talking too much. Other questions? Can you comment on UFOs and extraterrestrials? You know, are are are, are the beings that arrive on UFOs, or are they going to be frightened of us? Um, and then how is <laughs> how are how are extraterrestrials <clears throat> going to uh, going to influence us, or or are they going to scare us? Something like that. If you can comment. Well, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think they're going to show up here, and I don't think they have in human history. So I, I don't think there's any connection between UFO reports and extraterrestrial life. Um, so I don't know what the like what the, the likelihood of extraterrestrial life is, but uh, UFO is a whole different subject, in my opinion. 
um, in, the, in the liner notes to the commercial release of the Voyager record, I talk about how the, 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 the big problem with extraterrestrials isn't space, it's time. Uh, if you, you know, a dozen starships could have visited the Earth and spent a year here kind of gathering information and made themselves as conspicuous as possible and then left. And the odds that any of that would have happened in the course of human tenure here is, are, are way, very, very small. Um, and it really, it's not just humans either. It's, it's since the invention of speech. So less than 10,000 years, really. Because, um, well, we can, you can give it 100,000 if you want, but uh, you, you have to have some capacity to, to pa pass down at least a legend of, of what happened. I, I don't think contact with extraterrestrials will occur in that way. I think it, it'll occur in some electromagnetic way. But the, the big question is, is time. If, if they last a long time, then we will eventually pick up on one of them. Uh, if they don't, then it's uh, much chance to your business. One more question. Yeah, what book are you looking forward to read in 2021? Oh, I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, nothing, nothing too relevant. You know, there's a new translation of um, the great Russian novel called Stalingrad that I've been reading. Um, a lot of what I read is history and, and biography. I'm trying to think if there's something coming up that I, you know, I don't, I, I, I reviewed so many books over the years and I've stopped doing that now. So I don't get stacks of galleys anymore. So I don't really know what's going to, uh, to happen. But I would put in a plug for David Deutsch. David Deutsch's two books are, in my opinion, the most important work of their kind uh, to have been published uh, in the 20th century. So I, if you're looking for something cool to read, David Deutsch. Hey, thank you all. I'm sorry I have to run. I know you need time for your meeting too. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ferris. Uh, you know, we very much appreciate your time and thank you for spending uh, almost an hour with us. It was, it was absolutely awesome. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, see you another time. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I had my mic <laughs> muted. I had my mic muted and I was talking to myself. And now I'm getting ready to share my screen again. Oh, let's see, where do I want to go? Right here. I just want people to start leaving. You know, it's like, come on. Oh yeah, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. Please stay. Right. Um, so yeah, we had to uh, turn the uh, agenda upside down tonight. Um, thank you everyone for... Uh, Hanging with us, uh, it, it, it happened. Uh, it happened early this afternoon when we did that, and uh, I just, I went. Well, you know, uh, let's accommodate him. He was very accommodating to uh, come spend an hour with us, and uh, you know, I, uh, I'm grateful. I had a great time. It was a great meeting. As far as I'm concerned, we could end the meeting right now, but you know, I guess I got a couple things I need to speak about. Um, let's see, how do I advance my slide? Hey, I, I'm pretty impressed that you got this high level guy to speak to our little club. So thank you for that. Yeah, so that was uh, the doing of uh, the, 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 the team of uh, Brandon Hamill and, and, and Ahmed, they worked together and, uh, and, and brought us this, uh, this, this, this fantastic uh, featured speaker for the night. So the thanks and 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 uh, goes out to goes out to them. I know Brandon has the connection with uh, with uh, Dr. Ferris, and uh, it's it's fabulous. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I was gonna say, Mark, you're giving me way too much credit. Many thanks to Brandon for helping with this. Yep, absolutely. So, all right, so here we are, uh, the board. How can I follow this up? This is I am under such extreme pressure. To follow him up and, and spend another thirty minutes talking about this. So uh, Don't ramble. All right, here we go. Thanks, okay. Gina. Yep. <laughs> all right, here's the board. Here's our faces. Um, I believe uh, the only one I didn't see on tonight was Gunner, um, and he might be working actually. So here we go. Treasury report. Um, 
Matt, you want to speak to this? Oh, the most exciting part of the meeting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, things are standing pat right now. We're, uh, you know, we everybody knows that we did pass a budget that involves a significant amount of uh, infrastructure uh, rebuild and, and investment in the club. And uh, it hasn't quite started yet, but it is coming. And um, so we're, we're standing pretty much with the 129,000 in the TCF and the, the PayPal is just kind of a, uh, an opportunity where occasionally we may need to buy something on PayPal and mostly we get membership uh, dues in from that. Um, let's see. And, and then I, I'm excited to be able to report and then, you know, Steve Emmert is actually the guy who brings this number in, but we've got an all-time high of 611 active members right now. And uh, I know that for myself, one of the things I want to know from the club is you know what what is meaningful to the membership? What what is the stuff that helps fulfill our mission of outreach and education, and also serving the members of the club? So, please feel free to you know let us know. Uh, look up on the website on how to contact the various people, and and uh, let us know how how can we make this the greatest club ever? But if there's any questions about the money, please let me know. Yeah. So yes, it's uh. It's uh, 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 very much a, a blessing that we have a, a nice account and uh, great members. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing I can say is, uh, hey, if you get a chance to get your vaccination, get your vaccination so that we can start meeting in fa meeting face to face and that we can uh, start having some star parties and uh, having some fun. Um, it's uh, it would be it would be great to see everybody again. Um, so my slide, just to let everybody know, did you know that the MES is on YouTube? Um, we talked about this at the last board meeting. Is that you know we're not we're not pressing this enough. Um, so I'm 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 pointing this out. Uh, you know I put that address on there. I don't know that that's uh, uh, helpful. But if you Google um minnesota astronomical society uh at least when i do that uh, a, a beginner's um video comes up on youtube so um i know i know it works um i don't know how it works with the other search engines i didn't try um but you know we got a few videos up there you know we have 30 subscribers i mean we're growing we're getting there um we're posting the the monthly meetings there every month uh, from the recording that we make, and then that post is being put on the forum. Um, I realize that that's not a big broad broadcast of, of the information, but it's there. Um, so uh, let's see. Oops, I think I how do I go back? Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, so there's all our videos, um, and you know we're there. Go check us out. Um, I know that we're working on like this next item, the uh, the MAS member orientation meeting. Um, Steve Steve Emmert is uh, going to do a, another meeting, and he's going to uh, um, do it as a Zoom conference. Uh, we're going to record it, and then we're going to post that up there, and we're going to use that in the future just to. Uh, um, you know, helps help help spread information about the club. Um, you know, and 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 I talked to Steve today, and he 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 is the membership coordinator. Just in case everybody does not know, and uh, he's gonna he's gonna do it. Uh, they probably might wind up being uh, ninety minutes to two hours long, but uh, we're gonna try to do our best to to get all the information in there because there's a lot of things that this club has to offer, and we want to squeeze that in there and. and and communicate that and help everybody get what they want out of this club that's a member. Um, so that's that's coming uh, March 20th, I guess, um, at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And uh, okay. we're going to post the link on the website for all of you. New that'd, be, that'd be great, Mark. Uh, just a quick comment. If you could break that into sections so you don't have to watch two hours, but you could like jump to the sections you wanted. I will, yeah, so I, 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 it is my plan that I'll do that recording, and I think I have software that I can do that. If not, I will put a gap in there, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a pause, and we'll pause it, and then restart it, 
um, I think that will work. So yes, thank you, Clayton, for that. That's a great, a great point. Uh, so let's see, uh, Anton, are you on tonight? Um, and want to talk about the loaner scope program. Yes, I am here. Um, um, well, as you know, um, members can borrow telescopes for a month. We have 13 of them, a variety of types. There are a number of telescopes available now. Uh, members can request a telescope on the website under members, loaner scope program, and you get opportunity to request or um, list your first three choices. There are just a few out right now, but as I said, mo most of them are in. So if, if there's a member who wants to borrow one, just fill out the form and, and make your um, request. We also have five DVDs and um, a, a, um, a couple of them are out right now, but um, others are also in and members can borrow those as well. So far this year, we've loaned um, um, 11 telescopes and we have two more going out this weekend. Awesome, uh, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Any questions for Anton from, uh, from, from the audience? Yeah, this is Clayton. I'm sorry to jump in with another uh, left out of, you know, out of left field comment. Um, maybe we could expand that and include like a set of filters that you could borrow, like more of the high end uh, O3, you know, ultra high contrast, things like that. Um, a lot of people have asked about seeing them. And I know in pre-COVID times, we would just borrow them on the field when we were observing together with other people. But I don't know if it's a club, if we had a chance to like kind of, you know, loan out a kit for a month to see which ones you like. I don't know if that's a great idea or not, but just something I thought about. I mean, you could expand the the loaner program, I guess. Yeah, that's a good idea, Clayton. Yeah. We'll have to approach the board to see if we got any money and see if we can buy some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess right piece. Post, post budget, I guess we, I, that should have been a pre-budget request, so. I think we could squeeze it out. No, I, I think that's a really good idea because there are a lot of pieces of equipment that can attach to a telescope that aren't the telescope. And, and I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Clayton. So some celestial events coming up before the April meeting um, tomorrow, March 5th, last quarter moon. But more importantly, if it's clear tomorrow morning, get out. Get out by 6.15. I, I looked this up for my location at 6.15 east southeast. Mercury and Jupiter are going to be less than a degree apart. Um, should be a great binocular shot, at least, you know, at, at that, that, that altitude. Um, you know, maybe you can actually uh, pick out Mercury. You know, because I always, I always struggle with that. It always gets lost in the glare of, uh, of, 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 of the light, um, of the light dome. At least for me, looking east. Uh, so that's that's kind of cool. Um, and then uh, Mercury is going to be at its greatest western elongation then on Saturday, the sixth. Um, and then the other things, uh, you know, the the part that really gets me going is this daylight savings time beginning on March 14th. I mm. don't like that. I, it, uh, you know, it means that I can't start my AP, AP stuff, uh, an hour later. And it's already, you know, we're already losing time because of, uh, of getting close to the spring equinox. And that just means that summer's coming. And then that means it never gets dark. Um, and then the full moon. And then, so April 1st, you know, and Hey, no fooling. Uh, we are having a virtual meeting again on April first, so we'll we'll see you there. Um, Mark, and then, hello. Yeah, I I saw Mercury this morning. It was uh, very low on the horizon, and the sun was coming up uh, right away, so it was very hard to see. But I first spotted a Jupiter, and then with the telescope, I could see uh, Mercury right close to it. That's awesome, Mark. I, uh, I, I, I couldn't because uh, I think that's too low at my place. I think it's in the trees and I might have to go find a hill tomorrow. Um, anybody else see it? I guess I'd be interested to hear that. Okay. So the first public star party of the year is uh, March 20th um, at Eagle Lake. Um, the current and the same 
COVID restrictions are going to still apply that were on last fall, actually in, uh, what would that be? That would be no, uh, December, was that when the, uh, the conjunction was? The same, the same are gonna apply there, that you're gonna have to register um, um, uh, 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 to, to plan to come and it's gonna be spaced and it's gonna be everything we were doing last year, nothing has really changed. Um, and then we have a member, a member thing going on with uh, the Messier Marathon. Uh, I, I, I worked hard this afternoon with the, uh, the people uh, associated with this. Uh, there was a bunch of people saying, well, let's just cancel it and just get out of it. And I go, well, let's not do that. Let's, uh, let's get out there and observe and let's open this thing up and make it kind of an honor system for everybody. And uh, you know, you choose one night between March 10th and April 10th. In between there, I realized that you know that it, it, it that that actually almost includes two new moons, so um, that should give you opportunity to uh, to get out of the clouds. But choose just one night, log your observations, and then submit those observations to Jerry Jones, and he will uh, uh, run them through and uh, and 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 figure out who is. Uh, who's the winner and uh, you know we'll send out some prizes. Um, Jerry suggested we get to, we get together in 2034 or something and and uh, at our, our next little face-to-face uh, uh, -face meeting but I think he was joking but yeah you get those to to Jerry uh, by the April 15th um, you know and th that's the only way you're going to be eligible so that was that's kind of a way to uh, get around this COVID thing and uh, yeah, sure, you're not going to be observing with your buddies, um, but at least you can get out and observe. I guess that's that's where I am. That's what that's what we're all about. Um, Shresh, are you on? I am here. Here's Hi, your buddy. Uh, well, uh, the B thing's been uh, having some pretty big crowds the last uh, two three months with our virtual presentations. I want to say thank you to our presenters so far this winter, Bob Kerr. Mike Shaw and Dave Faulkner. Mike Shaw's presentation, Precision Sky, Precision Night Photography Planning, uh, had 67 attendees. And then Dave Faulkner's talk just a few weeks ago on Mythology of the Night Sky had 82. And that one was actually recorded and is available on the MAS BSIG forum. Uh, we had some issues trying to record Mike Shaw, so unfortunately we don't have sound for that, though we do apparently have video. Uh, upcoming, uh, for the BSIG is on Saturday the 27th at one o'clock. I will be presenting all about deep sky objects. Uh, and the synopsis for that is basically, have you ever wondered why nebulae are different colors? Why are galaxies different shapes? And do they tend to live alone or as part of a crowd in the universe? Uh, why do stars explode? And can we see the aftermath of that when they do? Uh, we will go over this and other interesting questions. We'll also review the various types of deep sky objects from gaseous nebulae to star clusters to galaxies and beyond. Uh, finally, we'll also examine the stages of life of stars from their birth to in massive gas clouds to their excitable youth and their stable middle age where our sun is currently and finally to old age and death but not every star dies in the same way, and some stars even come back to life. Tune in to find out how. Uh, on April 17th, Bob Curl hosts uh, part two of his presentation, The ABCs of Stars. And then finally, on April 24th, weather permitting, uh, we will have our first observing session of 2021. Um, there's some issues right now with Metcalf. We lost AC power out there, so we might end up doing that one at ELO, it really just depends on where we end up with Metcalf, with how wet the field is and all that. But hopefully uh, we get to see you guys on the 24th, it's been a while. And um, we will obviously be following the COVID protocols that are set forth by the, by the board. So that's it, Mark, thank you. Mark, I think you're on mute. Oh yeah, I was sitting here talking to myself again. Okay, so we've secured, uh, we, we have the astrophotography workshop, uh, August 7th. I told you last month to save the date. 
Um, and now we have secured a, uh, a, a kind of a featured speaker. Um, it's, we're going to work around him and and and, and provide some provide a program. Um, we kind of have a shell put together, but uh, we're still hammering it out. But uh, plan on uh, August seventh with both some classroom type uh, things, hands on stuff, and then we're going to take that and move that to uh, the evening also, and uh, and 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 do some things in the evening, uh, weather permitting and weather cooperating, and and. And talking with Mike, uh, you know, even if uh, even if it was raining and we're at ELO, it's possible that we can uh, still do some things inside uh, and, uh, and do some hands-on stuff. Um, uh, you know, and all this is, of course, limiting, going to be limited whether or not uh, we get the wide open uh, from the DNR and the state of Minnesota so that we can we can get together. Otherwise, it's going to be complicated and we're, you know, we're going to be you know, we can't, you know, we can't get too many in that classroom out there at ELO. It's, uh, it's just not, not big enough. And uh, so we're going to see, stay tuned. We'll see what we can do. Um, as every month, I uh, am going to put out the call for Gemini articles. Uh, I haven't heard anything from Father Brown or, or Brian. So uh, I have to believe that the membership is, 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 is meeting the call to deliver some articles and uh, uh, please continue to do that. Um, I know I entertained at least one email this last month about somebody that was uh, trying to contact them and find out some details. Um, and so, I mean, if you have any questions, obviously you can contact Father Brown or you can contact me or, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you connected and we'll figure out what we need to do. Um, as I have threatened, better know a constellation. Nobody contacted me, so now I'm going to give you information about Leo. And I chose Leo because it's galaxy season, um, or at least the start of it. And, you know, anybody that's got one of these uh, long focal length telescopes and, uh, you know, I have, I have my cameras and uh, I've been testing uh, I get excited. Late winter, you start seeing Leo, and uh, you know by by midnight or so, you know uh, in in February, Leo is getting high enough, and we could get uh, I could get some shots of, of of galaxies and groups of galaxies in in, in Leo, and I kind of got excited. I I already got uh, I call it the Leo quad because I I have, I have the Leo triplet, but then I added NGC thirty five ninety three on there. And it's pretty cool. I, 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 I'll, I'll post it and, and share that with everyone. And then, um, what was it? Uh, Sky and Telescope. Let's see, it's laying here in my office. The April version has some stuff in there about the Leo triplet. And I noticed that on the, uh, on the, on the star map that's in there that they have M90, M95, M96, and 105. And I went, wow, those are close enough together too that maybe you could, you could get another triplet if you have uh, a wide enough field of view. Um, I imagine that you visual um, um, observers have some trouble getting those, uh, would have trouble getting those three in there. It, 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 I think it's a, a little more than a degree, almost a degree and a half, I believe, to where you'd have to have a field of view and, and then, you know, it, it, it would be tough, um, you know, and I know even just the Leo triplet, I think getting the three in a view is uh, is a struggle for some people. So uh, and, and their equipment. But I know, you know, if you get out to ELO, I know I have seen the Leo triplet at ELO through the the twenty inch Dobsonian out there. So I know it. I know it's possible. Um, let's see what else have I got. I've got some more details about this. I wasn't going to just uh, torture you with things that uh, are related to the uh, to the. Uh, um, to, yeah, uh, Leo, yeah, Leo is good because they have a lot along with Virgo for finishing up the Messier uh, observation list. Yes, absolutely. And and just to let you know, if nobody volunteers to do um, Better Know Constellation for next month, I'm going to do Virgo and I'm going to punish you some more. Um, so some things about Leo. Um, I was only interested in the... Uh, the 
and, and oh, this is one of the things that I found like when I was doing my search to, to prepare this. And I have some friends that love to annoy me because they they, they think it's funny that they, when they bring it up, uh, they go, how's the astrology going? And I just give it the, what What are you talking about? And because they know I'm an astronomer and they know that I get very excited and kind of look at them with uh, the, the angry eyes about when they compare my hobby to astrology. But as far as the mythology, I just want to point out to kind of just follow up on Dave Faulkner's thing uh, that, that he did for the BSIG is, is you know, I, I did look it up. Uh, you know, Leo, Leo is a lion um, and was killed by Hercules. I thought that was, I didn't realize that. I thought that's why it was in the sky so that it would live forever, but I didn't realize it had been killed. Um, you know, I don't really want to take up too much more of your time, but I know there's a lot of galaxies in that, in, in that constellation and, 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 you know, I, I, I really enjoy them. They're, uh, they're, 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 they're fun to look at. I know that for sure, even though I have, I have cameras, but I do have a telescope. I do put an eyepiece in once in a while and take a look, you know, um, I do love that, that, that hamburger galaxy. Um, it's, uh, you know, sometimes a little hard to see, but uh, it's it's bright enough. Uh, I do enjoy it. So uh, let's, you know, so let's get out there and observe. And I think I have my slides mixed up or I lost one. Yeah, what happened to, what happened to Jerry's slide? Well, so Jerry did, Jerry did not join us tonight um, from the Astronomical League. He had no awards for the night, but he did tell me to get out there and observe. Um, and actually, this is, this is all I have for the meeting. Um, the next meeting, April, April 1st, Thursday again, uh, Ahmed, I haven't talked to you, I know, but, uh, I presume you're working on a, on a speaker and, yep, uh, I got, I got a couple from the Minnesota Institute of Astrophysics, but I haven't confirmed either one of them yet. So, yeah, that'll be terrific. You know, terrific. as always, those guys are those guys bring a good show, and you know we haven't had one of them on in a, in a while, so that that'll be great. Um, just let me know so I can connect with you. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? Any uh, anything anything pressing? Anything that we need to act on? Um, I guess. It, Merle, are you on? I just wanted to ask and make sure that we confirm that uh, we're going to apply the same rules for the uh, public star party. And somebody was also asking about LLCC, if Ken is on to talk about that. Oh, good idea. Uh, which rules are you referring to? The COVID rules, the same rules that we had for the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction is what uh, we intend to uh, apply because Really, the DNR hasn't changed any rules, and I haven't talked to Carver County as to whether or not anything has opened up there. So, we are having a committee meeting, and I, or uh, in, a, in a couple of days, and I want to uh, discuss what we might modify um, as far as uh, operating a public star party. At the very least, it'll be the same but I'm trying to get ideas on improving how we can uh, um, make it a better situation, so. Hey, you guys, can you, this is Suresh, can you keep me in the loop on what you guys determine? I don't know what the limit of the crowd size is right now. It was 25 last time, but is that still the same or? I need to check on stuff. And like I said, we want to maximize it and like I say, at the very least, we'll have the same rules, but I, I want to poke around and see if we can't make it better. Yeah, so yeah. Just, just to let Shirash and, and, and Merle know that I am currently working on revising our rules that we have posted on the website. I want to, uh, I want to investigate. I want to see if we can, I agree with Merle, open this up just a little bit to make the experience better for our guests. Um, especially our guests that are not members, um, and uh, you know, see if we can make it better. Because um, I, I, I have no idea as to how many star parties we're going to have to go through 
this year to operate under these rules. Um, and, and it's going to be, I realize it's going to be a, 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 a moving target. So, um, you know, Merle, uh, maybe we should have a, a conversation maybe before your, your committee meeting to just, so I can, I can, I, I can express some of my rules and some of the investigation that I've already done. Um, I'm in the process of, of editing what we had. Um, so let me know. Okay. Uh, yep, I was thinking the same thing that we uh, we should talk. Uh, our committee meetings Monday, so uh, if you can call me when you have a idea. Yeah, I'll I'll connect with you after the meeting. How's that? Okay. Anybody have anything else? Yeah, uh, there was a if it's clear tonight, uh, just a reminder for everybody to get out and see Mars two and a half degrees south of the Pleiades tonight. Oh yes, that's right. There was a question in the chat about electrical at Metcalf is it completely yeah. gone it gone forever yeah. or so so what happened was we had to replace the shed at Metcalf because it was kind of falling apart and unbeknownst to us the day that the shed was taken down uh XL Energy came by and said that we're going to remove the um I, I can't remember the term junction box or whatever they call that thing over there because the wiring was too old uh but they didn't really come up with a plan to fix that. So at, at the moment, we do not have AC power at Metcalf, which is kind of unfortunate as we're getting into B6 season. But it's something that we're working with Excel now to try to figure out a way to get that back. Um, so I'm probably going to host the first B6, the one in April, on April 24th at ELO, um, if the weather is cooperative uh, because of that. Um, I don't know, like for the B6 events, how many people actually need the AC. I, I think it's quarter to a half. And so that's kind of the thought process as we're trying to figure out what we're doing. But yeah, it's for the moment, there's no AC power. Anything else? I, I, I didn't hear if Ken was on. Vols, I know you're on. Have you talked to Ken about LLCC and w what's what's the possibilities up there? As, as far as we know, the the published star party dates are still a go. Um, Ken does request that um, we con that you contact Ken so Ken can make sure that the that the uh, uh, Markham house is unlocked. There you have it. I was not able to see anything on the where was the dates published because there's nothing on the calendar on the website. Uh, we'll we'll. We'll try to finalize that uh, over this coming week and get those published uh, within the next few. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Awesome, everyone. That's all I have, unless somebody else has something else. <clears throat> Does anyone know what the bell uh, rules are going to be when they reopen? Bell Museum. I would say check their website. Um, yeah. I know they're open. I saw an ad. Where did I see an ad? I think I saw an ad. I didn't on see TV. much on there. I didn't see anything on their website specifying, you know, what limits. It's like time tickets. I'm assuming they buy tickets for a certain time, but correct. That's correct. That's correct. Hey, right. this is Dean. Go ahead, Dean. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just. As far as I know, the bell is going to operate in the same situation they were when they were last open, which is you have to make reservations ahead of time and they'll have like quarter capacity in the planetarium, something like that. But yeah, they open on next Friday. Okay, thank you. Anything else from anybody? Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's uh it's, uh, you know, it's not the same as being there. So have a good month. We'll see you in April. Yeah, I got an email from the Bell. They're open 10 to 4, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But reservations are required. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody.